Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are we getting on? Season's greetings to you. So, with Christmas just a few hours away, I think it's rather unlikely we're going to be getting a great deal of Fallout news over the next uh, week or so, week and a half perhaps. So, I thought as the year is wrapping up, and 2020 has been such a big year for Fallout in general, that it might be cool to take a look through the article Bethesda posted last week looking at um, year two in review, because it's been a really, really big year, and there's a lot of stuff that's changed in Fallout. Some of it not necessarily for the better, but a lot of it has been really, really cool as well. And I'm willing to bet a bottom dollar that uh, I have forgotten a few things as well, so I think this might be fun to have a little look through what Bethesda have got here for us, and a nice little way to round out things before the holidays start. So, let's have a look, shall we? Okay then. So, Fallout 76 Year 2 in review. <laughs> Oldie but a goodie with the picture there. I do like that backpack, it's very cool. So, with just a couple of weeks left before we wish each other a happy new year and head into 2021, hopefully it will be a happy new year, we wanted to take a look back at Fallout 76 development in 2020 and how the game continued to grow and evolve throughout the year. We're incredibly glad to have shared this journey with all of you. We'd like to say thank you for sticking with us along the way. Good for you. As you read on, you catch some stellar community stats, an overview of new features and improvements introduced throughout the year, highlights of your contributions as the community, and finally, new community calendar, which we've already covered. So, to kick things off, Jeff Gardner, the project lead for Fallout 76, had some words and warm wishes to share with you. So, it's cool, I didn't know this was in here. Hi folks, just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of the fans, old and new, that played and are playing Fallout 76. 2020 has obviously been one of the most difficult years in modern history, but it has been intensely rewarding to see millions of you come together in Fallout 76's Appalachia to meet your friends, make new ones, and go on adventures together in the safety of the virtual world we share. That uh, bodes well for the state of the game, actually, if the numbers are that high. That might be uh, a bit more of a, a generalisation across the game's lifetime, lifetime but uh, cool, that's not a bad sign, that. And we've been with you, playing alongside you, hearing your feedback in real time. Your commitment and love for the game has helped us continually grow and evolve Fallout 76. As 2020 brought some of the biggest changes and evolutions yet, we're thankful for that so many of you have found a safe place with friends here in 76. And we want to take a moment to reflect on a year that we had together, and while also looking forward to our plans for an even bigger and better year in 2021. No lack of ambition, anyway. This year we launched Wastelander, Steel Dawn, added a ton of new features into the game, including Seasons, One Wasteland, and which re-leveled the entire game, and our new Daily Ops expansion. Among a host of other things to keep you busy this winter, like camp shelters, all for free, because you, and all because you keep on playing. Sending us feedback, posting pictures of your amazing camps, and telling us stories about your harrowing encounters, and coming together as a community to share, build, and grow this game together. Because there's new free content and your work building the most positive supportive community in games, we've seen a dramatic rise in players in 2020, both new and returning veterans, which we'd expect from Wastelanders. We, all, we hope all of you, no matter how long you've been playing, and have made new friends and enjoyed exploring all the dark secrets of Appalachia. None of this would be possible without the amazing team at Bethesda Game Studios, nor without the continued support of our friends at Bethesda Softworks and Zenimax. We'll, hopefully we're all able to come out of our stay-at-home vault soon. Jeff Gardner, Fallout 76 Project Lead. So there's some cool little tidbits in there. Sounds like the um, game is in a healthier state than it is easy to get the impression it might be from social media in particular, which is always a good sign, so that's really cool. So, community stats, which is cool. Uh, interesting uh, things that have gone on over the course of the year. 2020 stats. I'm um, looking forward to seeing what some of this stuff is. It's going to be uh, an interesting thing. So, total nukes dropped, starting big. 5,015,873. That's a few. Most new region being the Cranberry Bog, which to nobody's surprise, I think. That is big. Total deaths is a good laugh. 702,284,423. And the number of times people died to falling damage, 16,110,917 at that point. It'll have gone up, of course. But that's a <laughs> significant proportion of people's deaths are self-inflicted, which is amusing. Yeah, very, very cool. Apparently more camps in the forest than anywhere else. Most popular events, Defend Workshop. Yeah, not surprised by that. Uh, the Horde events. Okay, that's interesting. That's probably got something to do with um, healing legendaries being part of the challenges. So I had a guess there, which is quite cool. Scorched Earth is one of the more popular events. Not surprising, given how often the nukes get dropped. <laughs> Feed the people. Okay, that's cool. And Fertile Soil. I'm surprised to see that as high as it is, to be honest. I know it's quick and easy and a lot of people just knock it out if they're in the area, which is probably why. 
but uh, yeah, it's still higher than I would have expected to see that particular one. 4,243,783 daily ops completed. That is a lot. Especially given that um, daily ops haven't actually been in the game all that long. So uh, yeah, there's obviously some good engagement they're seeing with that, which is really cool. And the pink nurse's uniform being the uh, most popular asylum nurse uniform. Cool. I've never actually seen it, which is interesting. So I uh, guess my RNG is not really on my side on that one, but uh, very, very cool nonetheless. Unless it's, maybe it's a uh, atomic shop item, that's possible. That would explain a lot. 54 million Scorch Beast skills, 674,542 Wendigo Colossus kills, 2 million Scorch Beast Queen kills. Pretty good. So I've got 2 million Scorch Beast Queen kills and 5 million nukes dropped. So that's interesting um, discrepancy there. I'm guessing they're counting for uh, the fact that other locations other than uh, Fish Side Prime get nuked as well in there. And a few occasions where people didn't succeed, but that'll be infrequent, I should imagine. Four billion seven hundred and forty one million nine hundred and thirty six thousand one hundred and forty seven scorched killed throughout the course of the year. That's a testament to just how many uh, people are playing in itself. Nearly five billion scorched killed. That is crazy numbers. That's awesome. That that kind of, to me, subtly bodes really quite well for the state of the game. Mind you, so does the Scorch Beast Queen stuff as well. Like, that, that's big. So clearly, the numbers must be higher than we think. Either that or there's people grinding out a lot of Scorched. So, total purveyor items bought, 81,683,000. That is big as well. A lot of script being spent there. <laughs> clearly, the purveyor has been a successful addition. Purified water drank. <laughs> Over a one and a half billion. Not surprising, it's uh, a pretty easy way of keeping yourself hydrated. But time's changing, of course, with the uh, introduction of the, the sort of flipping of the survival mechanics and making them uh, positive buffs rather than uh, negative debuffs for not being hydrated. So, yeah, but that's only a very recent change, so I'm not surprised people are carrying a fair bit of that around and stopping it. I've probably put a, a good few on that number myself over the last year. 299 million treasury notes acquired. That's a lot of daily tasks and uh, public events completed. Um, well, we'll probably dial that back by about a third, and that's obviously only since the launch of Wastelander, so probably shortly after that, given that uh, you have to complete that quest line in order to start getting treasury notes. So, yeah, probably 100 million or so uh, individual instances of treasury notes being dished out, which is a lot. Oh, that's really, really cool. Five millimeter shots, that's a good one to pick on. <laughs> Minigun ammo and uh, 24 million, no, 24 billion <laughs> five mil shots fired. 82,959,134. That's people using a lot of miniguns. Well, miniguns use a lot of bullets. That's that's really cool. That's a fun stat. I like that. So. Meat sp most spoiled meat dropped by one player. I'd love to know who this is. Six and a half thousand. I don't suppose that's in one sitting, and imagine that's over the course of the year. But that somebody uh, lets their meat go bad a lot. <laughs> but they're a carnivore, though. When to go teeth harvested? This is an odd one to put in there. But 115 million, 115 and a half million. That's that's a lot of dead windigos. Not nearly enough, though, of course. We need to uh, stamp those gross creatures out. <laughs> so, 2020 in review, kind of here. 2020 begins with playtests. Yeah, that's definitely one of the biggest additions this year. One we kind of take for granted a little bit towards the end of the year now. Um, but obviously for um, well over a year, we didn't have a test server for 76. So that was a, a big change and has certainly been a big influence on the content that we're getting and the, all the the condition of it and how well it works, things like that. Because um, I think it's fair to say it's mostly the, the core content has improved since uh, the PTS was introduced. So in terms of its, you know, its stability and its functionality, it's not perfect, it's still not perfect, we know that. But uh, yeah, it has taken a step up with the PTS and they've been able to develop and improve some of the features as well as they go along, which is always cool. So yeah, definitely a good addition. From the outside looking in, the beginning of this year may have seemed a little quiet. Yeah, that's true. It was the run up for Wastelanders and uh, they were nose to the grindstone on that so the updates at the back end of last year and the start of this year were definitely thin on the ground it's one of the um, mixed feelings i have regarding how small steel dawn is as an update uh, there's only there's less than 100 people working on fallout 76 so 
uh, in order to keep content coming regularly, they can't have every update be the size of Wastelanders. If we look back on that, it took them nearly a year to make Wastelanders as a whole. I think that was exceptionally large, but um, there were a good six plus months where there was next to no major updates for the game whilst they worked on Wastelanders, which really sucked. So, uh, smaller updates more often. I mean, I'd like to see bigger updates more often, but, uh, you know, reality being what it is, um, having smaller updates with a number of people and stuff. Good to have it more often and then not have to wait six months like with Wastelanders. So, however, inside the studio and later from home, we were all hands on deck finalizing new quest lines, bringing new characters to life, polishing up art assets and swatting bugs as we prepared for the impending launch of the Wastelanders update. When this major expansion for the game shaped up, we knew we wanted to bring in some of our most enthusiastic community members to try out new content and let us know what they thought prior to release. To make that happen, we built what would become our public test server and invited some of you to join us in the early Wastelanders update playtesting as we fired it up for the very first time. Impressively, there were surprisingly few leaks from that server, given the length of time we were waiting for Wastelanders and um, obviously getting that early look. There was a um, NDA at the time, which will have helped matters, but uh, nonetheless, sometimes things still uh, seep out, so it was quite impressive that there were no major spoilers really before then. There were a few, I think, but nothing uh, catastrophic, which is cool. With Wastelanders and every update since then, we've been blown away by the dedication and passion of the players who continue to drive a dive into the PTS. We helped us find and squash tons of bugs, shared feedback, and improved features in meaningful ways. The PTS quickly proved itself as one of the most crucial additions we've ever made to Fallout 76 by helping us launch more polished and higher quality updates. And that's largely thanks to you. We couldn't be more grateful for your participation and support, and hope you'll team up with us in the PTS again next year. So there's one really key example that really stands out from a change that the PTS made that's probably worth mentioning, and that's uh, Legendary Perks. The initial iteration of that back in, was it June, I believe? Uh, appeared on the PTS and was kind of underwhelming. A lot of the perks were not particularly useful, they were not particularly impactful or interesting, and there was a lot of feedback from the PTS on that, which ended up with uh, perks being pushed back from, I think it was supposed to be an early July update to September. So back by two months while well, they rejigged the perks, made them more interesting and effective and more valuable. And that came directly from the PTS, so that's a very good example of just how significant that's been for the game, which is really cool. So, Wastelanders changes up a lot for good, didn't it just? And for the good as well, it's definitely better for it. We worked hard to put the finishing touches on Wastelanders, and in April you joined us for the launch of the biggest update we've ever released for Fallout 76. Likely to be the biggest update for some time as well. Together! We watched as the face of Appalachia changed forever when people returned for the first time since the door to Vault 76 rolled open. Settlers hoping to build new lives, raiders looking to retake their territory, shadowy cultists, and even some goons who only wished to cause chaos flooded into the region that we called home for over a year. Yeah, these new players have only come in since Wastelanders will uh, be having a different sort of look to the game, a different set of memories, things like that, because obviously those of us who've been playing since the early days will remember how different it was back then, which is cool, and this year has kind of been that key tipping point for that, so it's been big. Wastelanders is one thing you definitely can't forget about the changes to the game, but uh, it's a big one and it's really made a big significant change. Uh, this was an early pre-Wastelanders uh, launch photo that was really cool. Uh, it's really interesting to see what they did with Crater. It was uh, very different at the crash space station before the Raiders arrived. We've, added, uh, we've aided our new neighbours as best we could by taking on all new main story and lots of new quests. We've explored new and updated locations, including faction settlements at Crater and Foundation, Based down threats like floaters and the Wendigo Colossus, and teamed up to tackle events like Radiation Rumble and Riding Shotgun. Radiation Rumble sadly has not panned out to be such a, um, a cool event. It's got cool stuff in it, but it seems to be more... It's degenerated into a uh, XP grind as people, particularly high level characters, trying to get their daily levels, often jump in there to do it that way because you can really farm XP from it. I mean, it's good that it's getting done and people are engaging with it, but uh, not quite the way it was expected to, I don't think. But, then again, when you get to those high levels, hitting a new level every day is significantly harder than when you're at a low level, so it does make sense. It's good to have some way of speeding that process along for those who are particularly in the high hundreds, so I'm not kind of surprised that that's developed. Riding Shotgun's cool. It's a fun event with some good characters in it as well. I do hope on down the line and in future Bethesda will do more with the Blue Ridge Caravan Company, because right now that's basically the only thing that's going on with them is Riding Shotgun, and they, there's some potential there to be interesting. And I think it's something that could potentially appeal to the New Vegas players out there and the big fans of New Vegas, because 
there's definitely bits of New Vegas vibe about the uh, Blue Ridge Caravan Company, so it's a uh, reference to Crimson Caravan, but seeing that sort of uh, embrace a bit more, maybe a bit more done with it would be nice in the new year. Over time, our efforts and conversations with these factions led to earning their trust through the reputation system, which helped us gain our, get our hands on advanced weapons, armor, and other gear in exchange for gold bullion. Yeah, the end game armor being basically secret service armor and stuff like that is, it tends to be the common goal. And uh, I don't want to say meta because I think that might be overstating it a bit, but it kind of is as well with the uh, introduction of the secret service armor and stuff. So uh, yeah, that's definitely a shift in the, the dynamic of the game, which is cool. Um, kind of a, a subtle sort of below the surface shift, but nonetheless. Some of those relationships blossomed enough that folks like Beckett and Deguare became loyal allies. They helped defend our camps against attacks, and we gave them a hand with daily quests and let them raid our wardrobes for new duds. And found, some of us even found romance. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen uh, camp allies dressed up in all manner of interesting things this year, which has been good for a laugh on more than a few occasions. Some of the weird stuff people put back in is uh, good for a laugh, more so than Deguare, in fact. It's uh, always entertaining. More dwellers step out the vaults. Alongside the Wastelanders release, we also welcome many new PC players into the community, bringing Fallout 76 to Steam. That was a good shift, and it will appeal to quite a few people as well, I think that's cool. Even more of you on PC and Xbox One, Dolphin Vault Suits for the first time through Xbox Game Pass. That has done very well for the game as well. And we're absolutely thrilled to have you with us. Let's see, I'm not quite sure how the um, financing of things work. Obviously, about nine months or so from now when uh, the sale goes through with Microsoft, um, Xbox uh, Game Pass funds will come back to Bethesda more directly in that way. But uh, I wonder how the relationship has worked thus far. I assume there is some kind of arrangement there. Perhaps a, a commission-based thing. But yeah, very, very cool to have it. Uh, as widely available as it has become through Game Pass, which is good for the health of the game, I think, overall, and getting more players in. Always good. New events merge and favourites return. In the months that followed, uh, we put on our fanciest masks and took part in the parade around Helvetia as a community favourite Fashion Act Day uh, event returned with updated rewards. So yeah, Fashion Act was fun. I missed it the first time around. Finally got to play it uh, this year, albeit a few months late, pushed back by the launch of Wastelanders, but... Uh, had a bit of a wobbly start back in May, that one. I'm not sure what went wrong with it, but it, it was not performing well, to say the least, and they had to take it down for 24 hours before they brought it back. But once they got it going, it was cool and, uh, yeah, fun to dive into the event that I missed the first time around. So I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, fashion Act's definitely good. Still got a ton of Fashion Act masks that I need to get rid of somehow. But uh, clustering up my stash, but there we go. I'll have to uh, stick them in at a reduced price, I think. Obviously, Fashion Act has come back a couple of times throughout the year as well, so which is a bit odd, a bit of a weird choice. I guess they didn't have a massive pool to pick from at the time, so mixed feelings on that. It kind of detracts from the rarity of stuff, but at the same time, it is what it is. The sudden emergence of treasure hunter mole miners sent us scurrying into the ash heap to claim their loot for ourselves. Sometimes their new activities had a few rough edges. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your feedback on the first run of Treasure Hunter helped shape improvements to the Malt Miner's spawn locations and rewards when we brought the event back later on. Yes, the first time around they were in the Ash Heap and they were tied to the levels of the Ash Heap, which is quite low. So getting decent legendaries off the Malt Miners was not happening really. And obviously with a limited area as well, it made them harder to find and made the rewards harder to grind. Also, the initial loot list was the same as the Holy Scorched one, so second time around at the latter part of this year they changed it all up and that went through the test server as well and was uh, tested quite rigorously uh, they changed it so that the mole miners can spawn everywhere the introduction of one wasteland meant that higher level treasure hunter mole miners could spawn so you got a better chance of getting more worthwhile legendaries off of them which is a, a cool change and they introduced their whole new unique loot list for the uh, treasure hunter mole miners as well so making it more unique and individual and giving us new and more interesting things to get was a, a good move as well so definitely a big improvement via player feedback there which was cool so the legendary run seasons introduced 76 seasons as they're called that we kind of never use the term but yeah that's um, as far as getting people in on a daily basis and keeping people playing and engaged with the game I'd like to see a bit more in some ways, a bit more dynamic stuff going on in future but with it, but uh, it's certainly been a successful thing to hook people in and get them playing. They've kind of flipped it on its head by making Season 2 and 3 a bit easier to advance through. It's kind of good because more players can get more of the rewards, but at the same time it softens the need to be in the game as often. You can miss a few days, it's not a big deal. 
So it's that's mostly a good thing, definitely. But on the other hand, it's also like a little bit self-defeating, a little bit. But and then again, if people are more likely to engage every few days rather than every day, and the expectation to engage every day means that they kind of don't bother, and it's too much then actually it could be um, better overall, I suppose. So there is that angle as well. Spring turned to summer. We joined forces with Captain Cosmos and his sidekick, Jangles, during Season 1. The arrival of Seasons changed how we approached our in-game challenges to a, on a quest to earn as much score and loot as possible. We filled our collections with tons of cosmetics, consumables, currencies, and other item rewards as we ranked up and raced across the stars on the Legendary Run scoreboard. That was cool, because you had the little... We had... Um, Dr. Zorbo's ship as well that gave you an idea of how far along you needed to be uh, a marker to catch up with and surpass in order to hit rank 100 before the end of the season that was a cool little feature obviously uh, the subsequent two seasons haven't had that um, or any variation on that so that, that's a little unfortunate but again with it being at a leisure it's kind of less necessary so swings and roundabouts but yeah very very cool little thing that was it was fun uh, the update also introduced public teams. Yeah, something we kind of take for granted a bit now and uh, just jump into for either little bonuses, little buffs, or for daily score rewards. But uh, I know there's some people who do it in the way that Bethesda intended. There's plenty of people who do as a, a way to meet and play with other players. So that's very, very cool as well. It's definitely been a positive addition. It made it easier than ever to group up with our current friends and make new ones and get bonuses as we took event on events and adventures around Appalachia together. Yeah, obviously um, the, that has also changed a bit with the, the launch of One Wasteland as well. The initial setup, people were going for building teams all the time because it gave you intelligence bonus and using that as a casual team. So they tweaked things and added the daily ops team type in and stuff like that. I think they still need to add a group finder feature in there. I mean, obviously you can just start a group um, with a daily ops function and hope people will come in and help you with your daily ops, but it's not that reliable. Um, I've seen other games that do a sort of behind the scenes thing where you can tag yourself as searching for a group for a particular event. And then once enough people do, it'll auto group you and give you a pop up with the option to go and do the event. Or in this case, daily ops. So something that does take the hard work out of it and means that people who are looking to actively engage rather than just be on a team, um, would be a really cool way of doing that. So uh, maybe it's something that will come in future, who knows, it would be a good move for Bethesda to make. But it was definitely a big step in the right direction uh, as far as the MMO side of things, the public teams. Cranking up the heat, summer raged on, new Terra sent us up underground to square off a towering legendary Wendigo Colossus during a colossal problem. After we toppled the beast and took its head as trophies, we came together as a community to search construct a new headquarters for the Brotherhood of Steel under the direction of the ever-eager Russell Dorsey, who convinced us they would soon make a comeback in Appalachia. We parted hard with Gram and Charlie the Moo Moo, and returned to the host the now famous meat cook for all their favourite humans. Oh, who returned, rather? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, meat cook, Gram's uh, meat week, that's a fun event. It's not the, the biggest deal, but it's, it's nice, it's fun, you get a lot of people running around just being a bit daft. It's fun, it's popular for a good reason it's put together quite well and uh, easy to engage with so definitely like that one the building up fort atlas was cool as well especially as you got to see it sort of develop over time between the two halves in particular it was that was a nice move and a nice way to build up the arrival of the brotherhood it was quite cool i don't think a uh, colossal problem panned out quite as well as it might it doesn't get um tackled quite as often as it might do these days and Getting the rewards can be challenging because of the limited group size for it. So sometimes if you don't get a particularly well-geared group or you get don't get a full group or something like that with it, it can be kind of hard to farm that for the cool rewards. So I know I've had trouble with that and had difficulty getting in there. Uh, obviously having to launch a nuke to start it makes the whole thing more of a, a procedure to get through. And then they're not... They're, Lack of reliability around getting good rewards out of it after all of that hassle is a bit frustrating to me. So I think that's something they could perhaps work on. But um, yeah, there's definitely room for improved engagement with that then. But it's still a cool concept and uh, definitely challenging high-level content, which the game definitely needs more of. So that that's good as well. So one Wasteland for All! September leveled the playing field with the One Wasteland update, which allowed creatures levels to 
difficulty and loot to automatically adjust to everyone individually. Suddenly, even our lower level pals could easily tag along during our travels and meaningfully contribute to fights that previously would send them running back to the comfy bounds of the forest. Yeah, good idea that. It also made the game a little tougher, which it needed to be. It was definitely, once you got past the initial kind of getting the hang of it and the vibe of it and the rhythm of the game, there was definitely not a lot of challenge uh, in 76 prior to One Wasteland and it's still very manageable now again we've got the, got into the new rhythm but it's a new level of uh, on that challenge which is cool i mean i think i think the game's better off for that i definitely think it was a good addition i was pleased to see that our heartiest appalachian adventurers also gain new battlefield tactics in the form of legendary perks which arrive just in time to give us an edge in repeatable randomized daily ops we geared up and hopped into public teams and proved our mettle against hordes of freezing robots and exploding super mutants on the road to create claiming rare awards. Yeah, we've kind of touched on legendary perks already, but they're definitely a cool fun addition. Daily ops, they're good, I like them, but I mean it's group focused content, so running it solo is kind of a pain. But I'd like to see more variety in it, which we know is coming, but the when part is obviously the big question. But that's something to look forward to next year. Obviously, certain locations I'm less keen on than others, and I'm sure you guys share that feeling. Freezing robots are nobody's favourite combination, neither are the um, resilient ones that you have to melee to take them down. The first few days when we got resilient over and over was really sucky. But they improved that, so it shouldn't be the same thing repeating for several days, so that's cool. But yeah, they're fun, I do like them, but there are certain variations where it's like, right, I'm just going to get in and out and uh, claim whatever reward I can get. Uh, just to get the score because I don't particularly do it in a group generally I could but it's not really my thing and uh, yeah there's, I think the game has room for more balance to do with group and solo play than uh, things that adapt more to whether or not you're in a group so they get tougher when you are and they become a bit more approachable when you're not that kind of undermines the desire to play in a group a little bit but there's plenty of people who are just not into that. Obviously, Fallout started out life as a uh, single-player game. This is a new thing that it is a multiplayer game, so there's a lot of people who do prefer playing on their own, but there's a lot of people who prefer playing in groups as well, so accommodating both is the ever-ongoing challenge. Armor Ace crushes the Red Vipers. Yeah, Armor Ace was fun. There's some really cool rewards in that. Really, really like the Power Armor skin at rank 100 in particular, and the Greenhouses as well. They're very, very cool. Very pleased to pick those up. Absolutely uh, love some of those rewards. And we saw the new scoreboard to battle alongside Armor Ace and the Power Patrol against the Subjugator and his army of Red Vipers in Season 2. That season, we gained even more challenges to tackle in the weekly lineup, including new daily ops challenges, and soaked up all the score we could during bonus challenge and double score events. Yeah, they pushed it on, made it easier for us to progress, which is cool. Along the way, we also picked up some new items for our camps, new power armor, weapon, armor skins, and outfits, and many other rewards. Yeah. In short, once you've covered the first season of after that, it's basically a variation on a theme. Getting towards the last part of the year, the Brotherhood is back. A little earlier than planned, <laughs> due to uh, some slight issues on Xbox, which uh, may or may not have been Bethesda's fault, given, uh, given the way it worked out on that and the back-end stuff. Obviously, they had to submit the patch with, to um, Xbox to, for deployment, and then uh, it ended up getting deployed early. Mm and caused countless problems, mostly because the patch on the version of the game on people's consoles was not the same as the one on the servers, therefore it just didn't work. So uh, they fixed it by releasing the update, which, of all the ways they could have done it, I think that's a pretty good way to go about. But uh, it turned out Russell Door of Sinks was spot on when the Brotherhood of Steel showed up on our doorstep in last month's Steel Dawn update, led by Paladin Romani, Knight Shien, and Scribe Valdez, who is an absolute sweetheart. They took up residence in the headquarters we built for them at Fort Atlas earlier this year. Even though they didn't always seem to appreciate what we've already accomplished in our own, in, on our own in Appalachia, we still worked hard to forge a relationship with these new arrivals. <laughs> on their behalf, we conquered new story missions, investigated important technology, explored locations of interest, and helped the Brotherhood standing among the region's residents. We, as we quested and completed more daily ops, we also secured new weapons and armor for our own personal arsenals. However, there's still more to come from the Brotherhood, and we'll find out where the story is headed in Steel Rain Quests next year. So, they haven't mentioned any third part of um, the update, or fourth, depending on your perspective. They've only mentioned Steel Rain thus far, but there's definitely space in um, the story moving forward, and the things that we know, and the situation that's currently going on, for this to take a couple of different paths. 
So I'm really hoping that they really embrace that and that there will effectively be two more updates. But uh, not surprising that even if that is the case, we haven't heard about the second one. But would definitely uh, like to hear about it to allay a few concerns. Def primarily around the, the length and the how long the content will last. Obviously, we all have a few issues with that and worries about it. Shelters take us underground. And this has had some mixed response. I think some of the some people like me are not blown away by the shelters. Uh, I like the concept and the idea, but the fact that they're all vaults so far, and it looks like shelter number four, when that eventually emerges early part of next year, probably, is going to be another vault room. And I don't want to build in a vault. Doing one vault build is all well and good, but they're not really conducive to creating... Different themed builds in the way that I go for it. I try to have them have a certain sense within themselves, Christmas trees notwithstanding. If you haven't already seen it, check it out up there. Um, so, build, as I said before, building a house inside a pre existing vault doesn't make a right lot of sense. The utility room is a bit different because it's a single small space, it's darker, the lighting's not so uh, well bright, I suppose. Uh, so, you can kind of do more with it and stylize it a bit more. But the lobby and the atrium. I'm not blown away by it. I'm looking forward to the caves that have been data mined and things like that. I think those will be more interesting. Basically, building a house in a cave doesn't make vast amounts of sense, but it makes more sense than building one inside a vault. So, there is that. But, yeah, looking forward to things like that more than the, the stuff they've released so far when it comes to shelters. So, when it was time to head back to our cosy camps, we didn't even consider kicking our feet up to relax. Instead, we dug into the earth to expand our abodes by constructing camp shelters. This gave us more room to flex our creativity as builders, and even more space to call home in these new lives we've carved out in Appalachia since we left the vault so long ago. Yeah, I mean, for a lot of people it is cool. For me, I like most of what they've done. There's just some of the style choices and the, the environments that they've given us so far. I'm waiting on something that's a bit more me. <laughs> so, Katie and Quill and Avalon await. Very cool, the current season. There's cool rewards on here, but there's also less cool rewards as well, so... I mean, keeping up that high level month after month after month is uh, always going to have its ups and downs. That's kind of inevitable. But hopefully we'll uh, have some more cool stuff to look forward to in subsequent seasons and a bit more interesting rewards to get out of it. So our final update of the year arrived this week and kicked off the third season with the Scribe of Avalon scoreboard. We've just... We've only just begun our journey through time with KD Inkwell, but we're excited to unlock loads of new rewards right alongside you as we uncover the mysteries of technology in a medieval civilization over the months to come. I'd like to see some stuff added to this that expands the kind of story, like KD Inkwell's Scribe of Avalon, their, their comic books, their things like that, you know, the themes to the different seasons. So maybe giving us like a comic book uh, as a reward, maybe a heart, part of the rank 100 so you can expand the story and uh, actually you know, thumb through it as a document, maybe. It would be quite a cool thing. And then you can expand the story, expand the concept to a bit more with it. It would be very, very cool. And I still think this guy looks like E.T. E crossed with Yoda, only evil. There we go. <laughs> so, last couple of bits and pieces. Shining the spotlight on you. Throughout this year, we have continued to highlight many of, of you with a variety of community-focused article series. You poured your hearts and souls into stellar camp builds, snapped tons of fantastic photos, Created fan art, role playing groups, podcasts, video content, and so much more. <laughs> it has been good. We deeply appreciate the community that's formed around Fallout 76 and everything you all contributed to it since launch. Keep sharing your camp photos, activities, and adventures with us, and we'll keep posting your endeavors on Fallout.com and around Appalachia Camp Creations and Community Spotlights. In case you missed those features, we rounded up some of the most recent ones below. Showed off your skill with a camera in around Appalachia. Inspire your inner photography with these themed pics. Red and Orange, Halloween Costumes, Cryptid Timber, Team Player, and Creature Feature. Those are some of the more recent ones, so uh, I'll link this down below if you want to head over and have a look at it if you haven't already, and you can uh, find these links then. Your camps have been a wonderful source of architectural design and creativity. Check out those fantastic theme builds, cozy, spooky, sweet summertime and outer space. Some of you joined us for interviews to take a closer look at your hard work, so some cool uh, individual spotlights which they've done as well. She had documented the wasteland with beautiful and detailed illustrations. Very cool. Gaming with maps dove deeper into the lore, both in game and real life. X Redek organized a community fight night at the Elgato pub. I'm assuming that's a camp build. Fallout 5 de dedicated themselves to saving the day as intrepid, re intrepid responders. Uh, a responders roleplay group. Very, very cool. I kind of missed that one, I think, but uh, that's a cool idea. 
Zero Fox FK is very, very cool and a wonderful photographer. Uh, helps us level up our photo mode game with stunning snapshots. If you haven't checked him out, you absolutely should. He does some amazing work with the photo mode. And thanks for taking a deep look at Chad at 4 76 podcast. Keep an eye on Fallout.com for the article next week, which you should definitely check out, because these are the guys who have just organised Fallout for Hope. Seems like a good time of mentioning that. Last week we ran through that. In the end, it ended up being over 300 content creators contributing to the massive event of raising money for St. Jude's. And the initial 50 grand target was smashed by day three and then blew right past the 70 grand mark and all the way to, I believe it got to up about 105 by the end of it, $105,000 raised for St. Jude's, which is an awesome bit of work on the part of the community. Massive props to uh, the folks behind chad of fallout 76 podcast for organizing that that's uh, absolutely incredible seemed like a good time to mention it so uh massive thanks to everybody who's do- donated and contributed as well that's uh, absolutely incredible very very cool thing to do and a very very nice uh, lead into christmas so down here we have the new community calendar which uh, i will skip over because we covered it in a previous video that i'll throw up here somewhere looking at the stuff that's coming up in the early part of next year quarter one so that's a wrap on 2020 fallout 76 made major strides this year but there's so much more we still want to bring to this game and the community we've already begun working on a variety of features events quests and quality of life improvements that we plan to implement next year we can't wait to share more about each new update as we approach them throughout 2021 warmest wishes to everyone as we head into our holidays we hope we join us for more fun in the wasteland in january so yeah lots has happened over this year and it's really really overwhelmed the game if you actually have a look at the um publications and the articles coming out about the game more often now the tone has shifted which is really nice and long overdue and a lot more people who reviewed the game early on and maybe weren't interested in it and now writing articles that are saying actually i've jumped into it post wastelanders and with the changes that have come in 2020 and i'm having a lot of fun with it which will come as no surprise to a great many people i think so that's been a really nice shift to see and the game is definitely very much moving towards something more positive but I have been rambling for quite long enough, and by the time I'm done here, it'll probably be New Year's Day. So, (laughs) I will wrap things up. Thank you all for uh, taking the time to watch. I do hope you've enjoyed a little look back at uh, 76 over 2020. It's been a great year. There's been a lot to go through. Obviously, over the next week or so, week and a half, I'm going to slow things down a little bit. It's Christmas. I'm going to take things a bit easy. Hope you guys are going to do the same. Bethesda probably earned it as well. I'm sure they've put plenty of hours in over the last year. So, hope those guys enjoy their uh, Christmas break as well. And we'll go at it again with full force early in the new year. Over the Christmas period, there might be the odd video, there might be uh, the odd stream here and there. Make sure you turn on notifications if you do want to join for those and hang out. As um, I'm not going to be sticking to a schedule for, for the remainder of the year. It's, you know, it's chill time, so definitely something there. But thank you all very much for watching. I do hope you have a wonderful Christmas and a very happy new year. If you're interested in such things, social media links, merch store, and channel memberships, all available down below the video as well. Supporting the channel is massively, massively appreciated. Uh, I've got some very cool stuff in there, so I do hope you'll check it out. Massive thanks to everybody who's done that already. And do join us for our somewhat intermittent live streams as well for the next week or so, and obviously they'll resume at full force five days a week in January. So I do hope you drop in for that. Fallout 76, definitely staying on the cards, playing Cyberpunk 2077, and having a really good time with it, really good experience. So is really really cool so i hope you'll join us for some of that as well so on that note massive thank you for watching do hope you have a wonderful holiday period and a great start to 2021 and i look forward to speaking to you all very very soon